Tonight, as we, we go to the attributes of God, we're, we're looking at the wisdom of God, and the question there on your handout says, studying the attributes of God is critical to address the issue of God's wisdom. And here's the issue. Can God be trusted to make the right decisions? Uh, we started out this series, um, I guess a month or so ago, from this quote from A.W. Tozer, which says, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And as this relates to wisdom, this really falls into line is if you don't think God is wise enough to make wise decisions, you're not going to trust him for advice. You're not going to go to him. You're going to think that you need to rely on other people. But if you believe that God is supremely wise, true wisdom comes from him, then you're going to rely on him. And so this next line, you can't worship a God fully if you only know him partially. And so we want to know God fully of for who he is. Uh, so to do that, we need to repair something, which is what I call the incorrect perception. And this is what I call the pollster God, okay? Uh, this is the, uh, once again, this is a, a bad perception that people have of God, and we're going to correct this through biblical theology, but let's look at this together. A pollster uh, it is someone who organizes, conducts, and analyzes opinion polls. Due to their research, they are able to take a cross-section of society, ask some pertinent questions, and provide the rest of culture with information regarding the leanings of the majority people polled. In light of this information, many people acknowledge the trends, adjust their thinking, and align their methods with the popular opinion. The times are changing. That's why the pollster God is such an alluring candidate for our societal flavor of the month theology. Does that make sense to you? Okay. We live in a culture where it's just changing all the time. What are we going to believe? Because we can't fathom adhering to archaic directives in such a progressive time, the pollster God exists to ascertain what people want and then give it to them. As soon as he obtains the direction of the culture, he adjusts his thinking to be relevant with the times. Now, does everybody understand that I'm saying I don't agree with this? Okay, this is not a good view. But does our culture believe in a pollster God that he is currently changing his mind on certain issues in our culture? Would you agree with that? God used to think this way, but now he's, he's addressing the culture and realizing that we're being progressive and he's trying to play catch up, right? So at your table, here's a pollster question for you, okay? What are some of the areas that you feel like right now in our culture that people are trying to make God adjust to our beliefs? You follow me? Okay, so what are some areas in our culture where we feel like God has got to change his mind because our culture is changing his mind? So at your table, talk about a couple of those. On your mark, get set, go. All right, as you discussed as a group, do we have some issues where it seems like culture thinks that God is changing his mind? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, we say, well, God, in the olden days it used to be like this, but now, obviously, as culture is progressing, and we can say, well, that's the way that your grandma used to think, so therefore God used to think that way, but he's got to come up to dates with this. <coughs> we have churches, we have denominations, we have leaders who used to take a stance on certain issues that are now going completely opposite of that. In fact, there are even churches in this city that would have the name Baptist upon it that does not believe the same Baptist doctrines that you believe. You follow me? Very, very different. Um, and so, so what's happening here is this, is that we see a time in our, our own culture where we feel like that the words of God are outdated. And so therefore, people will believe that I know God used to say that. I knew back in that culture it was okay. But we start doing what the Pharisees were doing and, and creating traditions or expectations on top of what God has already said to try to make it work. Uh, but and so, so with this, we've got to realize to repair that image this. God is not a pollster. Uh, God is supremely wise. God is not going around trying to pull the culture to figure out how he needs to do things. God is not creating a survey to see what he thinks about marriage, about gender, um, about purity, about holiness, about any of those things. God does not need our input. God is not dependent upon popular opinion. Uh, as the old pastor used to say to me, he says, uh, you, you can't vote God in and he's not going to be impeached and he's not going to retire either. Okay? Uh, and and there's, there's a lot of truth to that. God's not going away. And so his wisdom, the very nature of it has got to be that it, it endures. And so um, when we look at this, in, in our culture, we depend upon the popular leanings of the day to determine our positions on current issues. The wisdom of God balks at any position, listen to this, limited by time and culture. If a concept only has a temporal shelf life, it cannot be categorized as truth. Only God is able to determine, define, and demand authentic wisdom. So here's the deal. If uh, there is something about wisdom that only lasts for, say, 100 years, that's not wisdom. 
That's just common sense knowledge that's for a season, right? Wisdom is something that lasts, endures throughout time. So this is what's incredible about the Word of God is that can you take the principles in the Word of God and make them work today in 2018 in Greenville, South Carolina, and also somehow in Middle East 2,000 years ago? Yeah. It's amazing that you can apply these biblical principles throughout any culture at any time, and only God's wisdom can do that. So let's look at um, th this line here, but the wisdom of God, if we have a definition, the wisdom of God means that only God knows how to come to the best destination by the best path at the best time. Okay? So the wisdom of God means that only God knows how to come to the best destination by the best path at the best time. And as you write that down, I want to invite you to turn to Proverbs chapter 1 as we talk about wisdom. Just for a little bit. Uh, for those of us that um, I think all of us would say, uh, would, would you in, uh, benefit from a little bit more wisdom tonight, anybody? Okay? Always a good thing. Um, and so we want to, to look. Proverbs is 31 chapters on wisdom. I know some people who pray a psalm in the morning and read a proverb at night. Or they read a proverb in the morning to make sure they get some, some marching orders for the day. But this, for the most part, is a father talking to a son about wise living. Uh, I'll also say this. that uh, Does anybody know who wrote most of the book of Proverbs? Anybody want to take a guess? Solomon, you're right. Solomon was called the most, the wisest man, right, that's ever lived. Did Solomon always make wise decisions? No, no he did not. <laughs> this is what's interesting. I wish I knew there was a copyright date on the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Okay? He wrote those three books, at least they're, they're attributed to him, most of the Proverbs he did. I want to know which one came first, which one came later. Because Solomon got way off his rocker later on in life, right? I mean, he started out really well, you know, basically like this. God says, Solomon, I'll give you anything you want, right? Well, you know, if God says you get one wish, you just ask for more wishes, right? That's what you do. But no, what he did in this moment was he says, I want to lead wisely. I want to have your wisdom to do this. And God says, I'll give you that. Well, guess what? I provided everything else he needed. And he lived and operated out of wisdom so many that world leaders would come to him and ask his opinion on how to do things. So he was incredibly wise. But what happened later is, think about it this way, he knew what he needed to do, but he failed to act upon it. So this, is, this should be a warning sign for all of us that some of us know what to do, but later in life, don't do it. You can have all the wisdom in the world. If you fail to apply it, that's not wise. <laughs> you can have the information, but you've got to apply it. So <clears throat> look at Proverbs 1. 1. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction and wise dealing in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. And the one who understands obtain guidance. Let me just stop you there for a second. It says, well, the wise hear. You know, a lot of times I always thought of somebody who's wise as someone who's arrived. You know, they got it all together. This just says that the wise keeps learning. They're going to continue to grow. There's more to learn. There's more to grow in this. And so there's nobody here who's, who's gotten to that place where they don't need any more of it. Uh, verse 6, to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Think about that. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so once again, that's not a I'm uh, scared of God. That is I have a proper fear of him. Knowing he brought me into this world, he can take me out of it, right? In, in his hand, my soul rests. And so therefore, the fear of the Lord, the respect of the Lord, the, the thing, knowing this... God is the author, the sustainer of my life. And so I've got to let my life fall in lines with him, not asking him to fall in line with what I want. That's where wisdom and knowledge comes from is that fear of the Lord. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, some of y'all know Jesus would even say, you're not supposed to call somebody a fool, right? And yet, well, well goodness gracious, Solomon got away with it. But he's saying this, fools, they hate wisdom. They hate instruction. Now, without giving a name, y'all ever had that child that just hate to be told what to do? I mean, it was like, I know that. I already figured that out. And you go, well, let's just see how that works, right? But sometimes, 
There can be those people, not only kids, but you ever had that adult who doesn't want to be instructed? They know how to do it all. They got it all figured out. Fools despise wisdom instruction. In fact, I want you to turn over a few chapters to Proverbs chapter 12 for a second. One of the, my favorite verses of Scripture and one of the most rudest you'll ever read. Here we go. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. <laughs> well, there you go, right? It's a really nice way of putting it. So if you ever call anybody stupid, go, no, I got a verse, right? Okay, but think about it. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Well, who in the right mind has ever said, oh, I just would love somebody to discipline me, <laughs> correct me, instruct me? It goes this. Some of you know that healthy fear of God and the way that you would equate it to a healthy fear of a parent, that they would discipline you because they loved you. And that even sometimes... Um, Disciplining a child for running out on the road is the most loving thing you can do because if they continue to play there, they're going to die. And so, I mean, I have known, some of y'all know this, some of y'all been that parent that a child has run into the road, you got them out of it, and what did you do? You spanked their bottom right there. You go, why in the world would you do that? I'm okay, because the truck is worse than the spanking, right? And I want to wake you up to this fact. This is important. The reason why I do that is I want to wake you up. You run out there, this is much worse. And so whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. And so, you, so I, once again, I don't know how many of you have ever gone to your parents and said, thank you for disciplining me when I was a child, right? I just thank you so much for that. Um, but it says, whoever loves discipline, you love knowledge. It encourages you. It, it, it allows you to understand some knowledge of the truth. Um, whenever I think about one of the um, outside of my home disciplines that I got, okay, I'm going to go back to 12th grade for you for a second. Uh, I played soccer at Greenwood High School, um, and, uh, and one of the things that happened was on our soccer team for years, we had what I would like to call South Carolina rednecks on our team, okay? And which means that you would think soccer is not that much of a physical sport, but it is because there's a bunch of just guys in South Carolina. They just would fight all the time. There are some, if you've ever been to a high school soccer game, they know a way that when the ref is looking this way to do some damage to somebody that you're running beside. Uh, and if somebody got upset with somebody, cards thrown, benches are clearing. And so normally if you, there's, there's this thing, a yellow card that a referee will give a player that says, you better back up, calm down, or else I'm going to throw you out of the game. <laughs> they just slow down, right? You keep going, right? But a red card comes up, and that means you're thrown out of the game. Uh, and you're, you're out of that game. Well, the problem was, um, and, and also uh, because our school had so many people who were always fighting, is that they decided they would match the league suspension. So if you got out of that game and of the following game, they would match an additional game to that to really enforce that discipline to make it happen. So. We were in a game one time. I was a defender. I wasn't really good at ball handling, but I could take anybody out who came near me, okay? I just was like a cleaning. I mean, I just go side to side, slide tackling everybody, clearing out. I, I started going, and the game was getting a little physical between another team, and I remember that I started running after somebody. They were going out with the ball, and I did a slide tackle. Slide tackle is you put your feet first, and you get the ball first, and if you happen to get the person and knock them out, oh, well, at least you got the ball, right? If you go for the legs first, they're going to call that on you. If you go for the ball and happen to get their body, it's fair game. Well, I slid into the sideways, got the ball to my teammate, and the guy, he might have fallen into a gate. I'm not really sure exactly how it came out, but it was it was a pretty good, I'm a big boy, okay? And so, I mean, I, I got the ball, and, and the ref came run up and gave me a red card, and everybody flips out because it was worth the yellow flag, maybe, okay? And, but it was a clean hit. It wasn't from behind. It wasn't body first or whatever. And, uh, and so everybody's, you know, I, I, I'm just shocked because I'm getting thrown out of the game. And then it hits me. We've got one game after that game, and that's against our rivals. And this is my senior year. And <gasps> I'm going to be suspended for all of that. So afterwards, I, I go to the ref, and I said, I, I, sir, I, I'm sorry, but I think you need to reverse that call or something. And he goes, let me tell you something, young man. He goes, that didn't deserve a red card, but the game was getting a little intense. I had to make an example out of somebody. <laughs> well, couldn't you have chosen him, right? Like somebody else, right? Not me. He goes, I'm sorry. Yes, I had to make an example out of somebody. It was a clean hit, but I had to calm everybody down. I said, well, it worked, I guess. So then I go over to our athletic director who was actually at that game. 
And I said, I know what the suspension is. He says, don't try to talk me out of it. And I said, you've got to talk to the referee. You've got to hear what he said. He goes, I, I don't care, Travis. He says, a rule is a rule, and I'm going to live by it. And I remember going to his office on that Monday. I mean, crying my eyes out. I'm a senior. I better get blah, blah, blah. You know, you got to let me do this. And he said, I'm not going to let you play in that final game because a rule is a rule. And if I bend it for you, I've got to bend it for other people. And he said, it's just not fair if I do that. And he said, one day you're going to thank me. And I said, one day you're going to be wrong. And I walked out. <laughs> I, I did. I, I, I thought, you are crazy. Can I just tell you that when I see him, he's still to this day. He looks at me and he puts his head down. He goes, are you still mad at me? And I can look at him and go, you made the right call. He made the right call. A rule is a rule. And if you bend it for one person, you've got to bend it for somebody else. And it was something I didn't enjoy that discipline. But was there knowledge gained there? Sure there was. Sure there was. Was it unfair? Absolutely it was. Guess what? So is life. And sometimes you've got to deal with stuff, and you've got to figure out what you're going to do. And so what did I do my last game? I got out the clipboard like I was an assistant coach, and I yelled at the boys from the sideline. You, you do what you got to do. It's something that's still a formative experience. And look what he says there. Whoever loves discipline, you love knowledge. You get discipline, you learn from it. Don't waste discipline from your parents, from an employer, from God Almighty. Don't waste that. Learn from it. Let that knowledge fill you up. But if you hate reproof, you hate discipline, you hate somebody telling you what to do, Scripture just called you stupid, okay? And that's not the normal way that I would like to encourage somebody, say you're acting stupid here. But if this Scripture just said this, if you hate the discipline, the knowledge, the wisdom, the instruction that the Lord gives, if you hate that, you despise it, you try to push against it, saying you're acting foolishly. You're, you're acting like a, you're a stupid person here. And this is serious kind of stuff, so we want to make sure that we are aware of what God's wisdom says. So just a few things to kind of unpack. Uh, let's look at these together. Number one, uh, God's wisdom over creation justifies His wisdom for creation. Okay? So number one, God's wisdom over creation <coughs> justifies His wisdom for creation. So if God's able to make all this stuff, do you think He still has the wisdom on how it's supposed to operate? Sure He is. Sure He is. So in God's unique wisdom, he was able to create all good works that we are able to behold. There's some verses there that, that remind us of that. And if God is every creature's beginning, it implies that he is also their end. So I'll give you an example. Right now in our culture war, are we arguing about what is marriage and what is not? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Here's the deal. If you created marriage, you have the right to speak into it. Right? If you say, I'm the one who came up with the idea, that's why um, a lot of times... People will say, well, you know, Paul talks about marriage and who can get married and who cannot. <coughs> but Jesus never speaks about it. Jesus spoke about it, all right. Matthew 19. Uh, the Pharisees come up to him and say, um, so can we get a divorce? And if somebody gets a divorce and they get another divorce and they get another divorce, we can get to heaven. Who are they married to? And Jesus says, you got all this messed up. He said, from the very beginning, this thing was not supposed to be this way. You had hard-heartedness, so Moses gave you a certificate of divorce to allow this to happen. He says, but it wasn't supposed to be this way. And you go, what does that mean? Well, back in the Old Testament times, if a man didn't like his spouse, guess what he used to do with her? Get rid of her. In whatever way he thought needed to, and there wasn't a law to protect it. So what does Moses do? He sets up a civil way to handle marital disagreement. It says, I don't promote divorce. But I'm going to allow a civil way for divorce to happen if it has to happen. And even in the Old, uh, New Testament, what does Jesus say? It doesn't have to happen in every case, right? The Bible permits it in certain cases, but it never promotes it. It never says it's a good idea. In fact, what does he tell Hosea to do with his uh, wandering wife? Go and buy her back. Bring her back home. Love her. Even continue to do this. But he says this. This is the way it was from the beginning. That God put one man, one woman together for life, and what God has brought together, let no man separate. Did Jesus speak about marriage? Yep. Do you speak about who's supposed to get married? Absolutely. Do you speak about genders? Absolutely. And it's saying it's from the beginning. Marriage doesn't need a revised version because God created it. it. It it still works. And so when we look at if he has the wisdom over creation, if he created something, he is able to justify his wisdom uh, for creation. Turn over to the next page there. God's wisdom can never be slightly improved. Okay? I wrestled with this one for a little bit. But God's wisdom can never be slightly improved. I don't wrestle with it because I disagree. I just try to get my head around it. 
If God's plans could become wiser by any iota, they are not perfectly wise, which would mean he would not be God. His understanding is infinite and without limitations. So, if you turn over to the left a few pages to Psalm 147. Psalm 147, verse 5, says, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond what? Measure. He's got his understanding, his wisdom has no measure to it. You can't contain it. So God's wisdom can never be slightly improved. God's not going to go to a class and next year be a better version of himself. So think about this. How long is God's wisdom imperfect? Always. Forever. Uh, we were talking, I guess it was a couple weeks ago, we talked about the eternity of God, the eternal nature of God, and how He's always been. It was really making my, my kids, their, their minds were just going, and we were talking about it, like, what do you mean, how long has God been around, you know, and whatnot. And I just remember saying, there's never been a moment where God has not existed. And Gloria goes, this hurts my head. I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight like this. And, and, and you know, and I said, that, that's a good thing, dear. Like, that's a good thing to try to wrap your head around this. But think about this. God's never improved. God's never picked up some piece of information like 200 years ago and thought, oh, now I got it. Now I figured out people. Now I understand how to relate to them. He has never, ever improved. Let me ask you this. Have you improved in your life? You're like, I don't know. Hopefully you have, okay? Do you, all right, let me ask, this is a better question. Do you still have room to improve? Anybody want to say that? Okay, yes. God does not need to be improved. There's nothing that he is lacking. There's nothing that he is missing. There's nothing that he is somehow deficient in. And so, um, I say this in a lot of counseling situations, but God is the expert in every single situation that you're, in, you're dealing with right now. He is the expert with your marriage issue. He is the expert in your financial issue. He is the expert in your health issue. He is the expert, you name it, he's the expert, Right? You got to go to a specialist. All right, um, I was talking to my mom about this the other day, and I said, "Well, have you talked to your doctor about that?" She goes, "Which one?" <laughs> it's like, "All right, like you go to that place. You have well, I have a family doctor and this specialist and this specialist and this specialist, and I don't know. This person gave me that medication. This person I haven't seen in a long time. You got to go to specialists. Even in the medical field, God's not a specialist. God doesn't say I'm only wise in this area. He's got it all." And so where does true wisdom come from? I'm telling you that even in Scripture that there is nothing that you need that God's Word does not possess. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, adequate for every good work. There's not a good work that you need to do that Scripture is not wise on. There's a lot of stuff the Scripture doesn't address, but he just promised that everything that you need for life and godliness is contained in Scripture. And I've been saying this to a lot of young uh, married people and, and uh, parents a lot, that a lot of times people like me, I got very discouraged when I became a dad, uh, when I became a, um, married and then became a dad, that so many people would come up to me and say, oh, you'll learn things about 20 or 30 years, you'll figure out what you didn't know. And that depressed me. <laughs> because I thought, so you mean to tell me my wife is just stuck with a dud? Like, you know, there's no hope for her? Like my kids, I'm going to like get them graduated and go, man, can we redo this? Because now I know God's word is adequate for every single good work. He has not set your marriage, your life, your ministry up for failure and just saying you got to get experience. God's word is wisdom for us. And so his, it's never improved what's contained in scripture is enough. Number three, God's wisdom doesn't require input from others. I love this about God. I love <laughs> He is not taking a survey today to figure out what we need to do. God's wisdom is brilliantly flawless, independent of any outside help. He is only wise. He is not dependent upon the assistance of angels, the suggestion of followers, or the opinions of the masses to decide his direction. So what you've never seen in, in heaven is this. God going, oh, wow, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> All right, let's get the angels together. Let's get a board meeting, right? Let's get a little... Let's get a little Brainstorm session, get the whiteboard out, get some good markers here, get some coffee brewing. We're going to be here a long time. we got to figure this out, guys. We don't know what to do. God doesn't need any input from even the angels themselves, right? 
He doesn't need any type of input to come alongside and say, hey, this is what you need to do. He doesn't need uh, the wisdom, a suggestion of followers or somebody come along and say, God, I think you should do this, right? Uh, that's why I love just seeing all the disciples come up to, to Jesus and going, Jesus, I, I think you need a, a little bit of help here, right? I think it's glorious. Uh, Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Some say one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus goes, yes, Peter, you got it. You didn't, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but God in heaven revealed this to you. And upon that rock, I'm going to build my church. And guess what's going to happen next? I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. And I'm going to rise again. And Peter says, can I have a word with you? <laughs> Jesus, I'm going to rebuke you. That ain't going to happen that way. I just would love to have seen the look on Jesus' face at that moment. You just called me the Christ, the Son of the living God, and now you're going to rebuke the Christ, the Son of the living God, because God's not turning out the way that you think he ought to turn out. And while you may have never done anything that blatant, I'm telling you that we sometimes will look at God and say, no, 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 you don't need to do it this way. It needs to happen this way. We forget that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. And so he doesn't require input from others. If he needed input from others, guess what? He's not God. He's not God. He is truly, supremely wise. Number four, God's wisdom must always be viewed in light of eternity. <coughs> God's wisdom must always be viewed in light of eternity. We question the wisdom of God when we focus on the current situation rather than the future glory. It takes time for true wisdom to be vindicated. I want you to turn over to Luke chapter 7 for a moment. Luke chapter 7. I haven't, I don't, it's funny that I said Matthew a second ago. I was like, I haven't said anything but Mark in a long time. I don't know. How to, but, uh, but Matthew and Luke and John, they're also very, very helpful. Uh, Luke 7, 35. Uh, let me set up this kind of situation to you. The Pharisees are upset with Jesus. Big shocker there, right? And, um, and they're basically saying that they're having issues with John and they're having issues with Jesus. Um, and he says, verse 30, let's go to the verse 31. He says, to what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So look, let me just stop you there for a second. He says, you religious folks, you, you're never happy. John the Baptist barely ate or drank anything, and you're going, this guy's weird. He's got a demon. And here I am. I go hang out with sinners, and I eat food, and I enjoy different things with them. And, and they're going, this guy's a glutton. What? And going, I can't, neither of us can make you happy. It's always going to be something. And then look what he says, verse 35. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. Now, there's a couple ways to look at that verse. It can be in, in the sense of, Okay, God is true wisdom, and His children will do things wisely. But I think what this verse is kind of saying, I think what Jesus is saying here is, when you make a decision, sometimes it takes a long many years before somebody says that was wise. It's like the time for a child to be born and raised and independent, that sometimes somebody will step back and go, okay, now I see what you did. Have you all ever felt like you needed to follow God and the people closest to you said you were crazy. Right? Times when I've been so, so clear about certain things that God was calling me to do because they were out of Scripture, I've had some of the most resistance from the people of God telling me I didn't need to do it. And you know what? I, a lot of times I've said underneath my breath, wisdom is justified by our children. I'm going to make this decision. I'll make this decision and just trust God with the results, and I'm going to see what happens here. Um, one of the greatest compliments I ever had in my life was from my dad. Uh, I told him one day, I said, hey, Dad, we were having this to, you know, I, I want to tell you about something going on in our life, and we're deciding to do this. And he looks at me, he goes, I'm not surprised by that. And, uh, and I said, what are you thinking? He goes, when I hear what you're talking about, he goes, it, it sort of makes some yellow flags come up to me because I think about, oh, well, what about this and what about that? And he, then he said this, he goes, but as a grown man, you've always made wise decisions, and so I trust you. I said, what else? Goes, That's it. 
you make wise decisions, so I'm sure this will turn out all right. I trust you. And I thought, I don't think my, my dad's ever said anything more like important for me to hear as a grown man that, that he, he said that to me. And I think what he's saying is this. All right, son, you did make that decision way back there, and I thought it was crazy. <laughs> but it came out all right. And, and you followed God here, and I didn't know if that was the right thing, but it, it came out all right. Wisdom is justified by our children. Sometimes you make a decision that doesn't seem wise in the moment. But if it's something that God is calling you to do, it, it'll take a while. But it will be vindicated. It will be justified by children. Um, any of you probably, we could probably have testimony times of stuff that you did that God didn't really reveal all the wisdom behind it until 20 years later, right? But yet you see how he was faithful even in that. Number five, God's wisdom is available yet restricted. And this is going to annoy some of you. So if you're not properly annoyed yet, here we go. God's wisdom is available yet restricted. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We read that in Proverbs 1.7 and also 9.10. But there is some wisdom that God does not provide us with right now. While we cannot ascertain all his decisions right now, we can trust that he is working all things together for good. All right, let's turn to these verses, even though they're in a couple of complicated places, but they're important. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. Ecclesiastes is after Psalms and Proverbs. Before you get to all the prophets, okay? And no shame if you have to look at the table of contents. No shame at all. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3. <clears throat> all right, some of you children of the 70s, y'all could start singing verses 1 through 8, right? Time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up, a time to kill, a time to heal. You hear it in your head, right? Okay, you hear that? Okay, you're like, man, that's a really good song. Hey, he stole it. Okay, um, but that's okay. Uh, sing scripture all you want. But, but this is when, in, in this passage where he's saying there's a time for everything, Solomon is saying, so there's times to understand things. There's some times that you're not going to get it. There's some times when you plant and nothing's coming up. There's some times when there's a great harvest. And then you get down to verse 11. And this is, I think, one of the most foundational verses of the Bible for me, understanding things of God. He says, He has made everything beautiful. Some of your translations say appropriate in that, right? He's made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity in man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Now, for those of you who've tried to understand all the wisdom of God as it relates to salvation... Second coming, justification, sanctification, glorification, you name it. And you've ever thought, I just don't understand it. There's a verse that just explained why. He says, he's made everything beautiful or appropriate in its time. That means that sometimes God says no because there's a better time for it. And he says he's also put eternity in man's heart yet so that, God cannot, so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So let me tell you what that means. I believe that every living person, God has put in their heart a desire and understanding and a very basic knowledge of eternity. There, there's kind of it, you go, well, I've met an atheist or I've met an agnostic. No, no, no. There is something deep down, sometimes even though it's covered up, that there's a, maybe there is a God, maybe there is a heaven, maybe there is a hell. I'm not really sure, but that's placed in there. God said it right there into, into man's heart, eternity into man's heart. Yet it says, he hasn't shown them everything. He's kept some things so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Sounds a lot like Genesis 3. You're not going to eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because you don't need to know everything right now. You're, it's not in your mind to understand, to determine what is good, what is evil. You don't need to have all the knowledge. Any of you ever had a problem where you read stuff in the Bible that says, all right, let's just be honest. Um, you look at a lot of Paul's writings, you look at some of the way that Jesus talked in the Gospel of John, and it sure does use words like election and predestination. Does anybody, that make anybody's head hurt? Does mine. You know what I did the first time I started reading them? I just went to the next chapter, kept going real quick. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about it. Because then you go, all right, let's just go back to those passages and say, whosoever will, right? I like those verses. Well, well here's the deal. How do you reconcile that the Bible is very clear that there is something called election and predestination, and God knows the, these things, and 
foreknowledge and all these big words, and yet also that there are these things about whosoever will will come, that how do you reconcile these things? And, and here's what I realize. If my finite mind can understand that right now, God's not that impressive anymore. I'm not needing to depend upon Him for that wisdom and strength. And you go, well, Travis, have you reconciled all that in your mind? Yeah, I have. I've reconciled that I can understand probably this much of who God is. <laughs> and some of it I know, and some of it it's almost like my mind can't contain it all. Like I can't understand how all this stuff works. I mean, I can't understand how God can be eternal. Like, what do you mean? Like, no, no, no. Like, he had to have a start somewhere, right? No, because if he had a start, he's not God. That hurts my head. It hurts my daughter's head. We don't go to sleep because we're thinking about it, right? Here's the reality. God said, you can't contain it all. I made it that way. You got a desire for eternity, but you're not going to understand it all. But that frustrates some of you, right? Some of y'all want to just get the manual and say, give me about 20 minutes and I'll figure it all out, right? You're talking about God here. <laughs> You're not going to get them all. Let me explain even further. Go back to the left to the book of Deuteronomy. <coughs> Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse number 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. You hear what he just said? He's keeping some stuff from us. <gasps> That's exactly what Satan said in the Garden of Eden. He's, you mean he's keeping certain things from us? You better believe he is. You know why? Because if he gave you every single piece of understanding right now, you would become dependent upon yourself and stop seeking him. How many of you have that moment in your life where you go, why, God? I don't understand why. At that time, in that way, it makes no sense. And he's saying, secret things belong to me. I'm going to reveal some stuff to you, but right now, you can't contain it all either. You can't understand it. Your mind won't be able to, to get your head around it, and you got to trust that in some things in life, you got to remember, I'm God and you're not. And that's hard, isn't it? <laughs> I, I want to know every single piece of it, but he's saying... My wisdom to you is available, yet there are certain things that are restricted. Is there a lot of wisdom in this book for us to, to get a hold of? Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to continue to go after it and never get there all in our life. But yet there are some things that I believe that God holds back because we just can't, our finite mind cannot understand the infinite God. Okay, last couple real quick. Number six, God's wisdom rarely provides instant gratification. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> That's why so many people don't like it. The wisdom of the world seeks to provide immediate pleasure, while the wisdom of the Word seeks to provide lasting joy. The wisdom of God guides us to make decisions for our eternal joy rather than our temporal happiness. I'd encourage you tonight, get lost in Proverbs chapter 9. Just study that thing to death. And what you're going to see is that there's the ways of the world and there's the ways that God gives us in wisdom, and they are very, very different to each other. And there's a... Uh, a, a woman who's saying, hey, come on inside the house. There's wisdom in here. You can come eat of it and enjoy it, whatnot. And there's this other little seductress woman over there going, hey, I got some stolen bread. You want to come over here and eat in the dark? And, and that, that's what the world is on. There's one way that we're going to have to cook the meal and take some time and work at it. Gratification. It takes a little bit. There's instant gratification. I've stolen it. I've gotten it right now. And this is why people don't want to follow God's wisdom because a lot of times God is going to say, you can have it, but you've got to wait. You gotta have it. You gotta wait. Why do I tell most young single people that their desires that they hate, that they can't feel like they get a control of, that they wanna get married, they wanna enjoy all the benefits of marriage, and they go, I just can't understand why well, I got these desires. Why won't God take them away? They're good desires, wrong timing. Wrong timing. You gotta wait. You gotta follow God's wisdom in this. You've got to be able to tell yourself no sometimes, and it's a good thing for you to do that. Um, number seven. God's wisdom should alter our daily decisions. The infinite wisdom of God is meant to be transferred to our finite decisions today. If we lack wisdom, God has promised to give it to us if we simply ask. God is the source of wisdom for us to make sound decisions in this life. If you've never memorized James 1.5, I encourage you to do it. He says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he who asks must ask in faith, 
For the one who asks without faith is like the man uh, driven and tossed by the winds, unstable in all his ways. And so it's this idea. If you feel like you need wisdom for a decision, ask him. You know what God's not going to do? No, I'm not going to give it to you. I want you to completely ruin the life I've given you. Please. I'm not going to. No, he gives wisdom to those who ask it. So there are many days that I will pray as a husband, as a father, as a pastor. God, I don't know what to do. I am clueless here. I've tried everything and it ain't working. Give me the wisdom. And does he give it to us? Absolutely, he gives it to us. And so when we look at this, this is the way that we, we end here. Regarding God's wisdom, each of us is either the, one of these three things. Ignorant, stubborn, or wise. We're going to do a poll in a second to see which one you're in. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but regarding God's wisdom, each of us is either ignorant, stubborn, or wise. Those are our three options. Let me unpack these first two for you especially. Um, sometimes I've said it this way. There's a difference between being ignorant and stupid. I'm going to say it a little different. Uh, there's a difference between being ignorant and stubborn. The word ignorance means I just didn't know. Right? I, that, was, that was information I never had. You see why there's a difference between ignorance and, and being stubborn? Okay? Have you ever come across somebody who just said, I didn't know God wanted me to do that? Uh, nobody ever taught me. Okay? Well, that's, that's called ignorance. Someone just needed to educate them in that. So once again, I, I think about people who said, I keep hearing this word tithe. What does that mean? Well, you tell them and they go, I've never done that. Oh, my goodness. I, well, that was a sin of ignorance rather than a sin of disobedience. You see the difference? Being stubborn is, I know what it says. I just don't care. I'm not going to do it. There is a, the difference of I was ignorant of God's wisdom, but then there's that stubborn side, which I know nobody in this room has ever been categorized as stubborn. So thankful for that. That, that is, I know what you say. I'm just not going to do it. I don't care what you say. I think my way is better, and you will dig your heels in the dirt, and nobody's going to move you out until you are just kicking and screaming, right? There's a difference between being ignorant and being stubborn. There are some things about God and God's wisdom I think some of us are ignorant about. We've never known. No one's ever taught us. We just were unclear of it. That's why I would commit to every single one of you, get in the Word of God. It has everything adequate for, for life and good works. It's in there. But some of us is not ignorant. Some of us is just we're being stubborn. It's what Proverbs 12 would say. You, are, you hate reproof. You are being ignorant. You are being stubborn. Or you are being just what they would call stupid. Just being stupid. I know what God says. He's not going to listen to it. Because you're obviously a lot wiser than Him, right? And, and so there's that. Or would you be considered wise? Do you make wise decisions? And, and here's the reality. You have never done anything wise that did not come from God. And you go, what about that time that I got new tires on before? Did God tell me to do this? Here's, here's I'll answer that. Really think about this statement. All wisdom is God's wisdom. Okay? All wisdom is God's wisdom. So if you just feel like, you know what, I think that we could save money on electricity and give it more to this. If we would just go to this and stop doing that, blah, blah, blah. You go, is that you just being smart? Sure it is, but I believe that all wisdom is God's wisdom. God has given you a gift of stewardship and thinking of things through and giving you the mental faculties to think through stuff. Every single thing that you ever come across as wise, that's something that God gives you. And here's the thing. We desperately, desperately need His wisdom. And it comes down to this. Will we be ignorant with it? We're not seeking it out. Will we receive it and just disobey it and call ourselves stubborn? Or would you be considered wise? And, and my prayer is this, that you would trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. own understanding. And how many of your ways? All your ways acknowledge Him and He will keep your paths straight. And so, Father, tonight, that's what we have.